Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 28th episode of Stories of Service, Ordinary People Who Do Extraordinary Work. And I am the host of Stories of Service, Teresa Carpenter. And I'm so excited because not only do I have another amazing guest, I have another amazing guest in person, and I served with him on the USS Russell back when I was a very junior surface warfare officer. So shout out to all my Russell uh, shipmates. We were just talking about Admiral Brad Cooper, and there are so many amazing people that I still keep in touch with. Uh, to this day from that very special moment in my U.S. military history. So anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Chase Hughes. Welcome to the podcast, Chase. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read his bio. And then after I read his bio, we are just going to get right into the questions. I've been wanting to do this podcast, uh, I think, ever since I started the podcast. And uh, I wanted to get to a point where I had a little bit more experience under my belt before I went ahead and interviewed you, because uh, I really admire your work so much. And I think that you're doing amazing things. So Chase Hughes, he is the leading military and intelligence behavior expert with 20 years of creating the most advanced behavior skills, courses, tactics available worldwide. He co-hosts a YouTube channel. It is called The Behavior Panel. It is awesome. It's got 443,000 subscribers. They analyze body language and human behavior in videos of public interest, sharing expertise in communication, body language, deception detection, interrogation, and resistance to interrogation. He is also the number one best-selling author of two books in tactical behavior skills. This is just one of them that we're going to be talking about. And he is the worldwide number one best-selling book on advanced persuasion, influence, and behavior profiling. He teaches elite groups, government agencies, and police in behavior science skills, including behavior profiling, nonverbal analysis, deception, detection, interrogation, and advanced behavior investigation. His Peace 4 Alpha course is a critical life-saving course designed for law enforcement and his human tradecraft course is specifically designed for intelligence operations personnel who depend heavily on serious human behavior skills. He has developed a groundbreaking world first interrogation behavior analysis tool and the TFCA cycle that revolutionized law enforcement training in the US. He's also the creator of the pre violence indicators index designed to alert personnel to pre attack behaviors and save lives. His book, The Ellipsing Manual, continues to reign as the number one bestseller on Amazon in the hyp hypnotherapy section five years after publication. He has also appeared as a body language expert on numerous podcasts and even the Dr. Phil show and has a TV show in the works. Welcome, Chase. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for, for, for it's so wonderful that you live here in the Norfolk slash Chesapeake area and we were able to do this podcast together. So first off, the thing that I always ask my guests, especially those of us who uh, serve in the military is, why did you join the Navy? Uh, you, are, you are a Navy veteran. And uh, what inspired you to join the Navy and make it a 20-year uh, career? I think it was selfish. Yes. Very selfish. I was a 17-year-old kid. I was doing horribly in high school. I speak Spanish, and I was failing Spanish. Uh, and I walked past a recruiting office in the mall one day, and the recruiter basically tested me out of high school. And I get tested out of high school and I turn 18 on a deployment on the Russell, actually mm -hmm. my first tour on the Russell. And I decided to stay just because I loved it. Mm -hmm. I've been a civilian for three years. I've got an extremely successful company here and I still miss the Navy every day, every single day. Wow. Wow. And yeah, I know you keep in touch with a lot of your Navy shipmates still, even Definitely. after all these years and you made Norfolk your home, which is a Navy town. So, um, it, it definitely sticks with you. And you were in the Navy for 20 years. You were on the Russell with myself, but you also did a lot of jobs that I think even delved into where you ended eventually up, right? Yes. So what was that job? So the jobs I did before I got out of the Navy, I worked under the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Group 2 for mm -hmm. a Navy dive unit. And I ran the Navy underwater robot team. Mm -hmm for a little while. And then I got into the expeditionary warfare side and I was, I became the captain of a sneaky boat that did <laughs> sneaky stuff. Very, very cool. And didn't you also spend some time in Guantanamo Bay? Uh, no. Okay. For some reason I thought you did, but okay. And then as you were transitioning out of the Navy, you started this path into entrepreneurship. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I did. I wanted to, I had a moment that uh, changed my life when I was a young kid in the military. And I was like, I had to be 19 years old. 
And when you're 19, you're, you know, you're in the Navy, a master chief is like the God, God. Yes. of the, of the oh, entire yeah. ship mm -hmm. and uh, like flawless, doesn't oh, yeah. make mistakes. Uh, mostly because they did, they do set a pretty good example. They do. And so we had a master chief on, uh, on the ship when I was young, he retired and two weeks later, uh, you know, I assumed he's going to go, I'm young, right? So I'm thinking he's going to go be the CEO of like Southwest Airlines right. or like he's going to go like <laughs> run the country right, somehow because right. he's, he's a master chief. And two weeks later, I see him organizing CDs in Circuit City mm -hmm. back when we had Circuit City. Right. And he was wearing a Navy veteran like ball cap. And I didn't, I didn't go up to him because I was kind of embarrassed for him. I'm sure he had plenty of money, like tons to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I lost sleep over that. I literally lost sleep. And I was terrified most of my career that the Navy would be the best thing that I had ever done. And then once I got out, then my days, you know, it would mm -hmm. be over. Like my life would, right. you know, my biggest achievements were behind me at right. that point. And that was my biggest fear. So I started like 10 years before I left the Navy, I started building this stuff and I was obsessed with human behavior. So I just started doing as much as I possibly could to manufacture content and do as much. I wanted to outwork every psychology researcher <laughs> in the United States. And I wanted to do more research than anybody and figure things out that hadn't been figured out before. And you did that with this book. This is what I would consider um, a seminal book. Um, if any, nobody maybe as familiar as I am with the animal world, except for other animal advocates, but the Bible for the animal world is a book called Animal Liberation. And I would mm. consider this the Bible uh, for behavior and, and body language and decoding uh, behavior. It's just, it's got everything you could possibly think of. And as I was reading it, the thing that struck me is like, it's almost like you took this encyclopedia of books that you had been it's been in your head and you said okay how can the common person absorb all this and 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 just take this and and use it is that kind of what your your goal is for the book it's kind of, well i spent a lot of that time and a lot of money uh buying books and a lot of government money so a lot of the taxpayers money went to me doing a lot of this research and i was looking for this book my whole life I wanted a book just like that. Like there's some body language books that say, oh, don't, yeah. you know, somebody Thought crosses their arms. Yeah. yeah. They're being defensive or mm -hmm. it was just a lot of or mirroring some yeah. of those real basic body language. Yeah. But I wanted a, a, like a gigantic master reference volume. But not only that, I wanted it to be based off of like peer reviewed research, not something like, oh, this guy was a, a cop in Louisiana for 15 years and here's what he thinks. That's great. Experience is wonderful. But I wanted something that was that was, you know, that was wow. at least minimally based in peer reviewed research. How did you go about finding all these resources? Uh, more money. <laughs> and because, you know, like when you go to like look up a document online right. research, yeah. like you can read like eight percent of it and then it's right. like and then you gotta oh, pay yeah. Yeah. For, for the gale uh especially academia academia yeah. charges and, and again that's a whole nother conversation about why academia charges so much money for the most basic studies right. but um is that what you did you did you just get accounts to academia academic journals i did and that's where about 40 percent of my personal paycheck went to all of these <laughs> online research things <laughs> and i was just it took me three years to get good at reading the stupid language that they use right. when they write these research. Because things. they make it so confusing for the yeah. lay person to actually understand. It's been one of my pet peeves. No offense to any of those who are in academia, but it's been one of my pet peeves about academia is that it's written in language that's so confusing that the yeah. lay person has such a hard time understanding it. So that's what yeah. you had to do first, right? It's super sterile, unapproachable. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think a lot of people who get out of college with a PhD or a doctoral degree, I've, I've got my graduate stuff from a university in Hawaii, graduate certifications from Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you go through college and your professors are boring, right? The smarter the professor is, the more boring they are. So I think a lot of our folks that graduate college with PhDs learn subconsciously, like 
I, I don't need to be entertaining or communicative. Right. I need to look like that professor to be I respected and, and to sound smart. So I think a lot of that comes from it. That's a huge tangent. I no, 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 no. And I think that that applies. And I'm sure that our audience can agree. That also applies to military war fighting. I mean, I can tell you, like, I just got over, uh, just got through JPME phase two, and it was an amazing experience. It's a war fighting school uh, here in Norfolk. It was, they were awesome to me, but some of the ways in which they write the papers, it's just not, it's good information, but it could have been presented in a way that was just so much simpler. Yeah. And unfortunately I feel like academia and even lawyer, I call it lawyer speak is just so confusing to the point where the average person can't pick up a book like the ellipsis manual and, and understand the ellipsis manual and understand what's going on where, where I could read this. And yes, it's a, it's a heavy read. And sometimes I, I definitely had to dive deep into some of the parts of it, yeah. but I could, I could get it. And yeah. I think, and I think that that was sort of what your intent was for the book, right? Hopefully. Yeah. To make something that was approachable, but it's just a fat, thick reference manual. Like there's not some stories in there. There's not like, let's talk about this imaginary mm -hmm. person name, whatever. There's no, it's just data in the book. But there are also some, 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 you do do a little bit of storytelling. Like you have a section in there for an example about metaphors. And I think oh, that, yeah. Yeah. um, that is one of the best ways to tell a story. Um, I was just using that in an example of, in a, in a, another context about speaking out while you're in uniform. And I said, would the, would you let an employee at Walmart put on his vest and stand in front of the Walmart store and, and protest work can, and, and just disc, you know, work conditions. No, you, you'd probably censor that employee. You'd probably, you know, and so I was using that as a comparison to, okay, let's, if we're going to protest something in, about military policy, I don't think it's a good idea for us to be in uniform while we're doing it. And I had to use that metaphor because I think it helped to explain that situation. And a lot of people sure. could, that could resonate and you do the same thing in the book, right? Yeah. You use same stories thing. to sort of you, and, and you use very, common stories, people who are dating, people who are going into a work environment. So you did use some of that. You've got some stuff in there yeah. about language yeah. and the different adjectives people use. Mostly in examples to mm -hmm. show you how to do a technique and all that kind of stuff. But I'm glad you liked the book. I did. Thank I you. liked the book quite a bit. I highly recommend it. Um, my one last question about the book, and then we'll move on to some of the other books and the behavior panel and the company, um, is did the book was the goal of the book to write for law enforcement or was it to write for just anybody? I think this might surprise you. I wrote the book for two reasons. I was, I would be happy if I sold one copy. Like the day this came out, it had a bestseller, the little orange thing on Amazon where it says number one bestseller or whatever. I screenshotted it instantly because I thought there was a mistake. <laughs> I'm like, they're, they're going to fix this mistake. You know, That's soon. awesome. At five years later, it's still there. Right. But they still make the mistake, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I wrote this book for me. And I wrote it because I had spent my lifetime looking for a book on persuasion, influence, and how to read people and how that all comes together. And the second reason that I wrote the book is, like, I wanted to make my parents proud. You know, like, my friends all, like, I joined the Navy. My friends went to Yale. Right. Uh so like I was this kid who like my parents spent all this money on private school and I'm just like kind of high school dropout basically. So I'm like, I need to do something to like regain my status. So this was like a deep uh, hole that I needed to fill personally that I needed to feel like I was smart enough to, to hang out with my friends in high school that all went to Yale. So that was kind of a, a, a deficit that I felt probably a false deficit that I did. Mm -hmm. I definitely did feel that. Well, I think that it goes to show you that sometimes our fears and our insecurities and our holes, even though they're not great, <laughs> they are there to sometimes propel us forward. I think so. Because I, I've definitely had some trauma and some things in my life that probably were incredibly hard. But when I look back on it, I know that's made me into the person that I am today. I'm a fighter. I'm an advocate because of those things that I went through. And so I don't regret them. And I'm so glad that they happened because... I will see myself doing things that I know other people won't. Right. And so I think that your 10 years of just diving deep based on this 
thought that you would never be able to get a regular job again, which is, I have that same fear, by the way, is, 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 is actually valid because I think it propels you. Like it's propelling me now to write this podcast and to sure. do these blogs and, and everything else. So um, I feel like I'm sort of following in your, you know, the example that you've set. And I think you're doing a damn good job at it. And that's, that's the thing. Like some people will make a conscious or a choice to let that deficit push you forward. And some people will set, let that deficit. Yeah. I could have just gone like, Oh, I'm, I'm a high school dropout. I'm, I'm a worthless. piece of crap. Right, yeah. right. I'm not going to do anything with my life. Let me go put in a job application at this crappy right. company or something mm -hmm. like that. So I think it's, that's a lot of that choice is about figuring out what's my deficit and how can I make that fuel instead of a downward force. Right. And how can I study something that fascinates me? and that I'm already super interested in yeah. and then use that and propel it forward. And I will say the one I said, I was going to stop talking about the book, but the one last thing I'll say about the book too, is the fact that there's a moral uh, tone to it. This isn't uh, let's manipulate everyone and let's get one over on everyone. This book has a lot of moral integrity to it. Is Thank you. That's something I picked up on as well is that you, talk about body language and decoding and hip hypnosis, but there's something about it in the way that you describe it to where there's, there's a moral side to it as well. I think uh, I, I really try to keep that in the book because I think the better let's, let's imagine like a person that's really, really good at manipulating other people. And we automatically assume it's a bad person, but now I tell you that it's a psychotherapist. So now they produce radical change in people a right. lot faster. They can help people a lot better. So my entire company's motto is we rise by lifting others. And I think this is a, a formula to leave everybody better than you found them. I love it. Absolutely love it. So you write this book and it blows up. You had no idea this was going to happen the way that it did. What do you do next? Uh, I think I just, I didn't celebrate. Hmm. That was one of my biggest things uh, that one of my coaches who's coaching me, uh, he said, what did you do after you wrote the book? And I said, well, I just started another one. <laughs> I started, started on the next book. Uh, oh, so gosh. I, I didn't celebrate anything. So that was a big lesson for me to start actually like, let's pause and like, this is a big thing. Let's celebrate it. Wow. That, that's a big thing to, to reward yourself and enjoy the moment. I agree. And a lot of people don't do that. We have a, a couple comments and, uh, uh, <laughs> Brian, Brian is my husband's best friend who listens to like most every podcast I do. He's a good guy. Your body language tells me you mean business, but you're a softie at heart, Teresa. Thank you, Brian. Um, so you didn't celebrate and you write this next book. What was the next book? The next book was called six minute x-ray, which is a behavior profiling book. That like, if that's like an encyclopedia, the six minute x-ray is like, here's the, like the fast, like here's a 15 minute recipe book versus like the- Right, because the there were probably some people one. who were like, oh my gosh, I can't even comprehend all these pages and I all would this not, information. I would not read a well, book like that. Like, I'm going to be honest with you guys. It's I made dense. it to page 190 and then I'm like, oof. This is this is this is a hard read. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest with you, Chase. It is. It's made. It's, it's made to be a manual. So that's uh, that's all it is. It's mm -hmm. just a manual. So so you so you make this other book that's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, saleable. I guess is the right word. Yep. More concise, mm -hmm. more powerful. Mm -hmm. And this is the same. The new book is the system that I now teach to intelligence operatives and intelligence agencies. Awesome. So you not only write all these books, you go around the country and you do seminars, correct? For, yes. For law enforcement and other people who are in the behavior profiling arena. Is that correct? Yeah. We have a lot of live events for like the public can come into. And I go around to a lot of companies and teach their sales team, like, here's how to spot the reason that uh, your customers are not, you know, mm. buying or your sales team is unable to identify that little thing right there is an invisible uh, objection or mm -hmm. a concealed objection or that little time that you, you talked about the terms of service and the person's lips kind of went like that. Right. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people need this, these kind of skills and it's, it's rapidly uh, helping these sales teams really, really level up. We do a company uh, last 
December. So 2020 December mm -hmm. uh, to a company that was worth $1.9 million. They're now at $21.6 million oh my God. based wow. on sales. Wow. So this stuff is important. It works. And you know, I, I always love challenging people. And so when I sent you that note about the wired thing, I, I said, Oh man, why is so why don't people understand this stuff? And why is wired basically just dismissing it? And you and I had a back and forth about that. And I think that's what you're tapping into is the fact that there really isn't a lot of science about this, correct? There's not a lot. There are I think I think there's about over 600 peer-reviewed articles on nonverbal communication and it, the veracity, like showing the veracity of it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the people in the field who pushed it really far is uh, named Paul Ekman, mm -hmm. who was a master of these microfacial expressions. If you watch the show "Lie to Me," you're probably mm -hmm. familiar with that. Uh, so he pushed it forward a little bit, but the reason it's 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 just not something that's uh, researched very often. But a lot of yeah. our body language comes from our behaviors a million years ago. So if somebody's fearful, like you watch a, if you go on YouTube right now and watch mm -hmm. a compilation of people getting the crap scared out of them, like dudes jumping out of garbage cans and scaring people, mm -hmm. everyone does the same thing. All of our shoulders go up, our hands right. go up, our wrists come together. These little things come out right here. We have the same facial expression as every other human. And we're born with with nonverbal communication and we have to learn language. So none of us learn nonverbal communication. That's fascinating. And there's 80 percent of our gestures. I think you said that in the book is is nonverbal. And I mean, 80 percent of our communications rather. And to think that there really isn't, you know, 600 peer reviewed articles compared to probably the thousands and thousands that we have on some label about some psychiatric issue sure. or something else. And, and so I think that's unfortunate. And I think that um, hopefully what you you're doing and what you're providing will push academia forward and kind of give them that kick to say, you guys need to study this a little bit more and, 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 and analyze it because it is a really good way of understanding how to not only interrogate somebody, but how to get along better with your neighbor or how, right. you know, how to, like you said, close a sales call or, or, or whatever. And so it's really important that people understand how to, how to pick up on those nonverbal cues. Yeah, and we can teach this to people who have trouble with this stuff. People who are on the the on the spectrum, mm -hmm. who may have autism or something, can we can turn this into a game, which has been done already with my the, my newest book. It turned into a game for children that are on the spectrum, where they get to spot a facial expression or spot when somebody's comfortable or uncomfortable, and That's they get awesome. to, it's really cool, and and it helps us to connect with other people so much better because we're seeing what's not being said. Right. And that's the whole, that's kind of why body language is interesting to people because it lets us be kind of a psychological uh, voyeur. You know, we're see, we get to kind of yeah. see behind the curtain of, of, of what's not, uh, what's not being spoken out loud. And that's, that's what attracted me to it. I had social anxiety growing up as a, as a teenager. And the more I read about body language, I could see kind of insecurities and fears and, uh, uncertainty and doubt and suffering and stuff like that and other people. And I realized like, wow, it's everyone not just it. me that's yeah, screwed up. Everybody's it. screwed up. Yeah. And it, like it <laughs> made everybody approachable. Right. Right. Uh, so that's what really hooked it for me. I really wanted to do that. And uh, a friend of mine was killed on the USS Cole uh, when the terror attack happened on the coal. And it was attributed to intelligence failures. So mm -hmm. that really drove me to like, solve these issues for a bigger purpose than me just like uh talking to a girl in a bar right which, right which was interesting to me when mm -hmm. i started doing this stuff sure, it's sure. very interesting <laughs> uh but yeah so that that's the whole reason i wrote the book wow and i think that it's only just going to continue to grow this this science is 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 so emerging and fascinating um and you now have a show on uh, YouTube and I think you just started it probably in like the last year, year and a half. I think it's been just over a year. Okay. It's called the behavior panel and it's got 300 and something, 46,000 subscribers. It's incredibly popular. And what was the genesis of you starting that? Cause it's not only you, there's three co-hosts and how did you guys get started with doing that? Yeah. So it's me, uh, a guy named Scott Rouse, who kind of emcees the show, there is a, a guy in Canada, 
he's a British guy in Canada. His name is Mark Bowden. He trains political leaders from all over the G7 on how to be better communicators. And there's a former army interrogator and army resistance to interrogation instructor, uh, Greg Hartley, uh, who is in, in the show. So we're all kind of body language nerds. <laughs> so kind of we eventually, you know, magnetize together uh, over time. And then the COVID lockdowns happened. And we just jumped on and like, hey, guys, you want to analyze a video together? And we were going to do it without recording it. Mm -hmm. We were just going to do it for ourselves. Right. For fun. Sure. So we just said, let's record it and throw it on YouTube. Maybe 10 people will <laughs> take a look at it. <laughs> right. And it turned into a show. And then we had Dr. Phil come on our show as a guest uh, wow. on the behavior panel. We've been on Dr. Phil a few times. And it's been unbelievable how fascinating this is to so many people. Mm -hmm. that there's this gap of knowledge right. where there we is. learn so much about language, but a lot of our decisions are influenced by nonverbal communication more than actual language. It's like when we get a gut feeling about somebody, it's most likely that the person was exhibiting something nonverbal mm, yep. that made us feel some way because we've been doing that for like 6 million years. The amount of time we've been speaking language is very short compared to that. And, and what really struck out to me about that entire thing, and this is something I think our audience can take away, is that you guys just took a chance with doing this because it was something that you were fascinated by. And then you're like, let's put it on YouTube and see what happens. Yeah. You didn't expect for this to be this series with 100,000 subscribers and become something great. And so it goes to show you that like you got to just try stuff out in life and yeah. you got to walk into things and sometimes uh things blow up and that's a that's kind of a sign that you're onto something correct yeah. i would say that like most people that i've encountered who struggle with some of that they're waiting for permission and they don't know who from <laughs> right and like the best advice i could give anybody that's starting out they're trying to do entrepreneurial like no one is coming to save you right. no one's coming to help you you're alone and no one's going to give you permission. It's up to you. You don't need permission and you don't need to explain if it doesn't work out. Right. Just do it. Right. And if it doesn't work out, try something else. It's not that big a deal. That's it. That's the best business advice I ever got was to fail faster. Mm hmm. Fail at more things more often because that means you're doing something. Right, you're you're putting something out there, and, yeah. and some things are going to work, and then some things are not going to work. But then you're going to learn from the things that don't work. What are the things that do work? And so That's you just true. have to try it. So then you wrote that book, and then you started going down the road of fiction. What 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 made you decide to go? Okay, now I'm going to write these fiction novels. So I just. Uh, I watched a YouTube, this is going to sound so stupid. So I watched a YouTube video on Ernest Hemingway one time and his granddaughter, Mariel Hemingway is a, a very close friend of mine. And I'm watching this video on how badass this guy was. He's a badass writer. And he was so badass. as a quick side note, he mounted 50 cal machine guns onto his sailboat and hunted German submarines off the coast of Cuba <laughs> by himself. So, I mean, that's kind of cool as a, as a writer. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I'm reading about like this writing process and like how he had this process of every day he would write at the same time and he would just crank out books. And I thought, man, that's cool. I'm going to write a fiction book. So it was just from a YouTube video. And I decided to write this book on what I know. Uh, so, you know, write what you know. And also the best advice is write what you want to know, which is how I wrote that book. Mm -hmm. So, I write it about mind control and all this stuff. Again, I'm thinking I should publish it under a pen name. <laughs> I shouldn't use my own name. And then I got, you know, the offer to get the TV show done and uh, we're casting for a Netflix series, uh, online series mm -hmm. and never thought that would happen. And I swear, like, if you are an entrepreneur and if you are struggling with anything in your business, imposter syndrome will never, ever go away. No. It's, it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. The only thing that changes over time is your relationship to it and whether or not you're hearing a fact or you're hearing fiction. So understanding that you're hearing fiction just takes some time to develop. So I'm talking to 
serious A-list celebrities, people who are big TV show hosts, they still feel that. These guys, like people that have been on TV for 25 years, still feel like a fake. It never goes away. Your relationship to it uh, is what makes the big change. So please take that. Uh, that was the, one of the biggest lessons I learned, and it took me too long to learn it. So hopefully I'm catching you <laughs> at a good time. I hope so too. And, you know, I've heard the same thing, actually. I, I've been around celebrities a little bit, even when I was uh, uh, just a liaison officer for Last Ship. And uh, just being in that environment, I saw it. I mean, some, some of the people in Hollywood are some of the most insecure people out there because, I mean, they're constantly having to put themselves out there and getting turned down and yeah. really dealing with rejection. And so, uh, but they do it. And I think that's what you, you, you're pointing out here. And, and I was having a very similar conversation with a coach earlier this week on my podcast about how I don't think that uh, your traumas ever completely go away. I think your relationship to those traumas go yeah. away. And the, the cycles that you stay in, like the shame spiral or whatever, gets smaller because you know that you're being triggered by something. Yeah. And so you, you move on a little quicker because you're like, oh, I'm being triggered. What's my tool to handle this? Who, you know, do I talk to somebody? Do I, do I just kind of feel the emotion and then walk through it? Do I go for a run? Uh, so I think that's what changes uh, over time. But I think that to think that you're just going to get rid of all that, I, I think that's an unrealistic expectation. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I, and, I, and I think that it, that's okay. Because like we said, sometimes it's that insecurity that, that drives you forward and, and makes you who you are. Yeah. So I think there, there's something to be said about that as well. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I want to get into that we didn't go into. What, what is next for your company? Do you have any other plans? I mean, you have so much going on. You've got, you've got, and you also do coaching, right? It's stupid. I'm, over, I'm <laughs> overcommitted. I'm yes. saying yes to everything. <laughs> uh, so I'm doing a lot of coaching. And so my goal for the company is to continue to produce things and over time just loosen my grip on the steering wheel just a little bit more each day until mm -hmm. I can kind of be ha a little more hands off, just hired a CEO to kind of run everything because I'm not a business person, right? I'm not a business mm -hmm. person. I'm a horrible business person. And I needed somebody there because I'm the creative person. I need a, a business minded uh, person to start running things. And I think the next big step for us is to start developing like immersive training products for larger companies, but also for mental health. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with an AI development company right now uh, called ClearSpeed. I'm on the board of directors for one of the biggest AI companies in the United States. I'm the chairman of the board for that company. <laughs> Stupid decision. I'm bad at electronics. But, <laughs> and we're developing these apps on, that can predict suicide, that can uh, predict whether or not someone's going to be or, or sliding into clinical depression or starting to do something just based on online behaviors. Wow. And I think that is really cool because uh, I think I invented this term, but I think a lot of us in the United States are cause blind. We're focused on symptoms and we're not focused on the root cause of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so we tend to be blind to the cause of this stuff. So if we can start looking at the root of some of these behaviors, like the fighting, the violence, and all this starts with some of these uh, behavior trends that, that we're starting to see. You can see all over the internet. Mm -hmm. You can. It's become very divided. And, it, and it's unfortunate because I think at the core, uh, us humans, we, we kind of all want the same thing. We all want uh, a sense of family. We want love. We want understanding. We want to be seen. And it doesn't matter what political party you're in. It doesn't matter what's happening in the news. And I think that's what the reason why people are so drawn to podcasts these days is because we all just want to hear from each other. We don't necessarily want yeah. to hear this polarizing message that's attacking somebody else or, or that. We just want to know what's going on in our world and, and how can how can we be how can we step up and help and yeah. be a part of the change and, and make a difference and make an impact. I think everybody really wants that. And so I, I, I thank you, Chase. Uh, you're definitely part of the solution and part of the people that is pushing a conversation forward in an area that has so little information and education. So there's, there's only thank a you. handful of you guys out there that are doing this. So if you guys haven't seen the book, uh, this is the seminal book, but he has, like we were talking, uh, a, a collection of books 
uh, Chase Hughes. You can find him on Amazon. Where else can people find you? Uh, just Google Chase Hughes. Yes. You have a very simple name, so pretty easy. To find. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking time to join us tonight. Thanks uh, for having me. Absolutely. This will probably be the last of my, some of my podcasts. I uh, I head back to work uh, next week, and so I might take a little bit of break. And I had a little nice nice run uh, while I was uh, recu recovering from shoulder surgery, uh, being able to do a few of these podcasts for you guys. Uh, but I will be catching you back uh, next. Next week, I have actually one more. I'm going to have some Instagram influencers. And then next month is when I'll catch you guys again. So if you're watching this, uh, thank you all for watching. Have a wonderful night. Uh, thank you, Merlin. Great video, guys. Have an awesome, amazing evening. And I will talk to you all later. Bye.